And hello and welcome to Open, the show opening the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I am Darren Jaime, and today we'll update you what's happening in and around our borough, as well as across New York City. Coming up, we'll learn about an autoimmune disease, discussing some symptoms and some common misconceptions surrounding it. And then later on, we'll discuss an education program that's providing South Bronx students with free documentary photography, as well as multimedia classes. And then after that, we'll talk about the importance of incorporating nutrient-rich ingredients right into your diet. Stay tuned, we got more details a little later on in the show. And then finally, we'll discuss how you can protect yourself as well as some family from common respiratory illnesses, things like influenza and the common cold during this season. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. Hello everyone, I am Darren Hyman. You are now watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers to the Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is being broadcast simultaneously on MNN's channels. You can stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms at Bronxnet TV. Some things have been going on throughout the course of the past week. We'll take you through it with some Bronx updates. And we start off with housing news. New York City has settled a federal lawsuit accusing its housing policy of perpetuating racial segregation. Under the agreement reached, the city will reduce the percentage of affordable housing units reserved for local residents within their own neighborhoods. Now, the current 50% community preference allotment, that'll be lowered to 20% until April of 2029, after which it'll further decrease to 15%. The settlement concludes a lengthy legal battle with critics arguing the community preference policy restricts choices for applicants who wish to move outside their neighborhood, also violating fair, federal fair housing laws. Now, New York City Mayor Eric Adams supports the settlement, saying, quote, it preserves a crucial tool for creating affordable housing while collaborating with communities citywide. City officials argue the policy, though contested, is vital in preventing displacement especially amongst low-income Black and Latino neighborhoods that are facing gentrification. In other city news, recently introduced a cutting tool, I should say a cutting-edge tool, that's aimed at enhancing student safety during their journeys to and from school. Now, the innovative app endorsed by the Department of Education offers real-time tracking for yellow school buses. Parents and guardians can conveniently monitor precise location of their child's bus as it progresses along its designated route. Accessing the app is straightforward. Simply log in using your New York City Public Schools account and your child's ID number. Now, remarkably, over 75% of buses within the public school system have already integrated into this tracking platform. And for those whose child's route isn't currently available for tracking, well, parents have the option to request the addition of their school to the app. In local updates, elected officials have introduced new legislation in response to the tragic death of a one-year-old who was exposed to fentanyl at a daycare center. Our Bronx Up reporter, Brittany Schuyler Albain, has a story. Three months ago, these parents lived their worst nightmare. It's impossible for us to try to find a way how to live with this pain. It's impossible. Their one-year-old son, Nicholas Feliz Dominci, succumbed to fentanyl exposure after the one kilogram brick was found in the children's play mats at the Divino Nino daycare center. Now, elected officials have joined together to announce new legislation that would prevent this tragedy from happening again. They want to make sure that 
policies are moving forward to make sure that something like what happened to their child can never happen again. New York State Senator Gustavo Rivera joined District 14 Councilmember Biadina Sanchez to roll out new policy. The bill targets the involvement of the parents and the knowledge of the providers and inspectors. Next to the license, there must be a message that says that parents are explicitly allowed to inspect uh, the facility for, you know, to their, you know, for, for, to that place. Exposure training will also be mandated for providers and inspectors must follow state level standards to identify drugs and illegal paraphernalia thoroughly. While city and state legislation are underway, there are talks about taking this to the federal level as phone calls are already being made to the White House. Our Congress member Adriano Espaya has been in conversations with the White House and the U.S. Department of Justice asking for additional enforcement support here in the West Bronx uh, because as the opioid crisis has gotten much worse. All involved want the community to know that they are working tirelessly to ensure that Nicholas's death is not in vain. Reporting for BronxNet, Brittany Schuyler, Albane. Very tragic story. Thank you, Brittany. That's all the time we have for our Bronx updates. We are taking a quick break, but we'll have more open when we return. Only 57% of New York City high school students are college ready by their senior year. Fifty-five percent of high school graduates either have no plans to attend college or are uncertain that they will ever attend. Thirty-four percent of young adults don't go to college because they can't afford it. Discover what's possible. BronxNet's education programs, internships, and opportunities help engage and inspire Bronx youth and beyond to pursue their passions. Be a part of the BronxNet family. Whether you're interested in our shows, joining a class, or donating to support our mission, visit BronxNet.org to learn more. I remember when the Bronx did not really have a media outlet properly representing the people of the Bronx. BronxNet provides for the community by being a community where people can be empowered to share their voices. We are in a really great place technologically. We've got all the resources that we need to be effective. Whether it's through cameras, storytelling, editing, we have provided those services for 30 years. BronxNet's mission is to be a voice for the community. To educate, to inform, and to inspire. And you can be a part of it. We've built studios for you. And we are back. While nearly 7 million adults in the U.S. live with plaque pariasis, much information still exists about the disease. Now, plaque pariasis is more than just a skin condition. It's a chronic autoimmune disease that starts within your body. And join me now sharing more is doc dermatologist Dr. James Song and plaque pariasis patient Marjorie. And we thank you both for being with us. And uh, Dr. Song, as we talked about, this is prevalent in the lives of more and more people. Um, for those who may not be so familiar, talk about how, this, how the onset begins. Yeah, so psoriasis is a what we consider an autoimmune condition. So it leads to chronic inflammation that affects the skin. And common areas that are affected are like the scalp, the elbows, the knees, but even the skin folds and the nails can also be afflicted as well. And as far as symptoms, it ranges from itching to burning, uh, as well as just soreness, especially when the skin starts to crack and bleed, especially on the hands and feet. And psoriasis can really affect any age group as well as any skin color. And so if you're more kind of fairly complected, psoriasis can look more kind of light pink to scaly. Whereas if you have more color in your skin, it oftentimes looks more purplish gray or even kind of brown. And in the wintertime, a lot of our psoriasis patients can flare because of the colder, drier temperatures, 
as well as the lack of light or sunlight, I should say, that can actually be beneficial for some patients. Yeah. And so I have Marjorie with us as well. And Marjorie, thank you so much for being with us and sharing a little bit about your story. When we talk about dealing with uh, plaque pariasis, obviously for yourself, um, you're dealing, you're overcoming, but how is this really uh, impacting you? Well, because my plaque psoriasis is primarily on my hands, on the palms of my hands and then on the tops, it affects everything that I do in my daily living. I, I, am an, I love to cook and I love to bake. So I have found that I have to wear an exam glove or exam gloves while doing those activities. And then um, once it hits springtime, I'm out in the garden and gardening gloves are going to be a must for me at all times, no matter how big or small the job is. But I think the worst part about having the plaque psoriasis on my hands is that I meet and greet new people. And we normally do that with a handshake. And I'm hesitant because I know how bad, how dry my skin is. And if they can feel the dryness and the plaques on my skin, it's embarrassing. Yeah. And Dr. Song, when you have a case like Marjorie's that she talks about, really the psychological, um, that's a lot to contend with. What advice are you giving people to kind of like deal with that? Because that's also, you've got to deal with the psoriasis itself, but then you also have to deal with the emotional and the psychological. Yeah, so absolutely. We know that psoriasis could affect your quality of life in many ways, not just physically. So I think first and foremost, you want to see a board certified dermatologist that could treat you holistically, not just from the skin, but some of these other aspects that Marjorie was just talking about as well. Uh, and for a lot of our patients, we recommend starting with topicals, whether that's a cream or an ointment to kind of relieve some of the symptoms. But for many patients, that's not enough because one, it doesn't treat a underlying cause of that inflammation, but it can also be uh, pretty tough to be using on a regular basis. And so if you have psoriasis and you're struggling with your symptoms and topicals are not enough to control it, and we really do recommend you know, talking with your dermatologist and maybe see if an oral option is ready for them. Margie, for yourself, obviously dealing with this has been somewhat of a challenge. Uh, you talk about the gloves, you talk about the other uh, different ad adaptations that you've had to make in life. What's it been like for you given the fact that you know that you've got to deal with psoriasis, but yet and still there's so much more of life that you're enjoying and there's so much more of life that you're embracing. Talk to somebody else who may be really dealing, but needs your perspective and understanding that, you know, this isn't the end. There's just some, uh, there's just some adjustments that need to be made. Yes. The first thing is to get a proper diagnosis of this. And I do expect, I do encourage people to go see their dermatologist and get that proper diagnosis and then work with your dermatologist to find what works for you. And Dr. Song, when we talk about that dermatologist and talking about getting that right person, um, you know, part of that right person is getting the information from your doctor and getting that information that's going to be right and relevant. So many times there are misconceptions, stereotypes, um, and we do a good job on this show of trying to debunk some of the myths and the stereotypes uh, that may be associated with uh, plaque psoriasis. And so uh, can you unpack a few for us about maybe what are some of the more common misconceptions? Yeah, probably the, 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 the most common misconception is that this is infectious, that this is something that you could pass on to somebody else. Um, I've had patients say that they can't go to the same gym or swim in the same pool as others because they were worried they were going to catch it. So there's a lot of misconceptions going on, and that's why Margie and I are really here on behalf of Amgen. We want to raise awareness about this misunderstood condition. But as I was mentioning before, this is due to an overactive immune system. You got the genetics for it. Something in the environment turns those genes on and you get this ongoing inflammation that makes your skin grow much more rapidly than it should. Yeah, and so Margie, for yourself, um, talk to me about winter. What's it like during the winter time? Winter can be more challenging because it's drier and the dry skin comes from the dry air. So you have to be more aware of moisturizers and what is best to use on your hands. Yeah, and so Dr. For you, not Right. It's not for everyone. Right. So what, what you use may not be the same thing as what everyone else uses, and that's understandable given the case scenario. Uh, Dr. Song, um, 
when we talk about patients coming forward, having that conversation, it's a lot easy for, as well as pretty easy for people to, you know, misdiagnose and self-diagnose. When is the time that people really know, maybe I should see a doctor? Yeah, so psoriasis can sometimes just look like dry skin or it can look like other dermatologic conditions as well. So if it's not getting better and you feel like you're seeing your primary care doctor and whatever that's they're using is not, uh, not, not improving your symptoms, I would recommend you see a board certified dermatologist, but also trust uh, sources that are vetted because there's a lot of misinformation out there. The one that I like is www dot the letter p something different so that's all one word dot com it's a great resource for everyone and i didn't get a chance to talk to you about triggers because when you have psoriasis what are some of the things that actually can trigger it again yeah so common triggers are if you get sick and it could be a viral illness it could be strep throat um, it could be if you got sick with a bacterial infection but also if stressed we know that stress mm -hmm. physiological stress psychological stress could trigger it as well as certain medications. And so I see this quite a bit. Someone started a new medication and their psoriasis flares. You know, I'm always looking at their medication list to make sure it's not one of the culprits. Yeah. And Margie, for yourself, obviously, you've got family. Uh, talk to us about that whole component of having a support network because as you're making some of these adjustments and some of these things really do have the emotional and psychological impact, uh, it is great to have a support group around you. Talk to me about that group. Well, my group is primarily my family, uh, and they're wonderful. They understand why my hands look the way they do, and they encourage me daily to find proper ways to handle my psoriasis, or they even remind me, put some lotion on. You know, it's, it's, that, it's that group of people. But most importantly for me is my dermatologist, because that person is my biggest advocate and is always trying to find something better that I can use. Yeah. Dr. Song Wan, thank you so much for being with us. I guess you gave some great information there. And then also, Margie, thank you so much for sharing your, uh, you know, your story and your journey. And best wishes to you as you go on, go on in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks All for right. having us. All right. Dr. Song, uh, I'll get you with one last word. Uh, again, tell people for more information what they want to do. Absolutely. So www.thelettertpsomethingdifferent.com. All righty. Dr. Song and Margie, they're talking a little bit about plaque psoriasis, uh, an up close and personal look. Again, the website, psomethingdifferent.com. Stay with us. We do have more open coming up right after this. 19.7% of Bronxites currently experience food insecurity. Meanwhile, instead of these nice, colorful foods, this is the best food that they have access to. If this sounds like you, there are a bunch of resources to get healthy food for free or cheap. If you want to help, you might consider donating or volunteering in one of these places. Community fridges like this one are all over the city and allow New Yorkers to conveniently donate extra food to people who might need it. Go to this link and find your nearest one. Food banks and pop-up events like these provide millions of healthy meals to families in need. These organizations are distributing meals to Bronxites as we speak and are always accepting donations and volunteers. It's your girl Kat from the Kitty Rose Lifestyle, also from the next chapter, where we discuss shades of gray every week right here at BronxNet, Saturdays at 11 p.m. Wow, 30 years, 30 years of BronxNet public access television. 
I'm a girl from Brooklyn and came to the Bronx 25 years ago, started my journey on BronxNet on public access television in 2016. And BronxNet is where I got my start. BronxNet, I feel like, is a home away from home. They support all of my endeavors, and I wouldn't have been able to be on any of the other channels if it wasn't for the fundamentals that I learned right here at my start here at BronxNet. So I am so appreciative. My son says I should stop telling people I'm from Brooklyn because I've been here now, Bronx Strong, for 22 years. So I'm so grateful, and I wish you much success in 30 years, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 more, because public access is necessary so that people like myself can have a voice. Yes, BronxNet, it's your girl Kat from Kitty Rose. Check me out every Saturday at 11 p.m. right here, Channel 68, the next chapter, where we discuss Shades of Grey. Mwah. And we are back with the new year, bringing renewed commitments to health and wellness. A growing number of consumers are actively seeking ways to lower their sugar intake as well as balance their blood sugar. Joining me now to discuss this is registered dietitian, nutritionist, and diabetes educator, Kim Rose. And uh, Kim, thank you for taking the time to hang out with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today with you. Thank you. And when we talk about, you know, blood sugar, one of the biggest challenges, I think, in the life of most Americans and most people around the world is really their sugar intake. And how detrimental can sugar intake be? Yes. So when we consume too much sugar, that can have a plethora of different consequences. And one of the consequences that we see facing us more and more often is that unwanted weight gain. So those excess calories. So when we step on the bathroom scale or even the scale in our doctor's office, we see that our weight may be a contributing factor to our overall health and wellness. No wonder why doctors, more and more doctors are saying, lose weight, lose weight, because it is linked with so many different medical conditions. And when we talk about these medical conditions, we know that a lot of them are becoming more and more prevalent. People are trying to be healthier. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, in the increase, I should say, of people who are saying, listen, I want to deal with my blood sugar, I want to deal necessarily with uh, my sugar consumption. Why do we think this is happening more? Yes, I think it's happening more because there has been a lot more added sugar placed in our snack foods as well as some products which we may think are healthy for us. So our consumption of added sugar has uh, gotten really out of hand lately and because we consume so much added sugar, whatever we consume in excess, the body will definitely store that in additional pounds. So when I hear people saying that they want to cut back on their weight or cut back on their overall sugar intake, this is a great strategy to do so. So if I'm looking out there saying, I wanna do this, I gotta get better on my sugar intake, wanna make, make sure that I'm really managing my sugar, what are some of the ingredients that I should be looking for, things I should be doing to improve this uh, area? This is a great question, and it's a question that I get asked a lot as a registered dietitian and a diabetes educator. So this is what I like to tell everyone. For anyone looking to embrace blood sugar balance, seek out foods that contain higher amounts of protein, healthy fats, as well as fiber. So I want you to think of peanuts. I want you to think of sunflower seeds. And the reason why I want you to think in these lines is because getting the most nutrition out of our calories is important. So consider prioritizing nutrient-dense foods. So for anyone that's listening, they may be saying, okay, Kim, you're talking about nutrient-dense foods. What are nutrient-dense foods? And that's a great question. So the Dietary Guidelines for Americans defines nutrient-dense foods as foods that contain vitamins, minerals, as well as other health-promoting components, and also these foods limit empty calories. 
So to give you a visual of that, that could mean reaching for more nuts and seeds, as well as fresh fruits and vegetables, not only during your meals, but in between your snacks as well. And we talk about snacks. That is a major problem for a lot of people. We snack throughout the course of the day, something to hold me over till lunch, you know, or somebody says, well, you know, this is gonna be right until dinner. But the reality is that some of the snacks that we're doing are so, so much harm. What are some of the good things that we could be doing when it comes to that actual snacking? I know you talked about fruit and seeds and, uh, and nuts. What else? Yeah, so let me start off with some statistics just to really put it into perspective about how important snacking is. Because I think a lot of people pay attention to breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but they don't pay attention to their snacks. So last year, according to Madur Intelligence, 61% of Americans made an effort to reduce their sugar intake. This year, according to Forbes, 32% of U.S. adults said that it is their top resolution to improve their diet. And we can even see it on social media with the hashtag blood sugar securing over a billion views on TikTok. So we see cutting back on sugar is a strategy for not only maintaining the overall diet, but also managing weight as well. So as people strive to stick to the 2024 resolutions they made in January, we may be seeing them reach for more blood sugar friendly snack options. The blood sugar, I think I might have lost you for a quick second, but I got you back here. The, you know, these blood sugar options are really great because when you talk about having a healthier lifestyle, we know the numbers are saying that more and more people are really trying to go in the right direction. Um, what are some of the things that are taking us in the wrong direction that we can put a full stop or a soft pause on right now? Yes, absolutely. So it is quite difficult to find a convenient and tasty blood sugar friendly snack option. I mean, I don't have to tell you, if you can just walk down the grocery store aisle, you may see them. And it may be difficult to find easy and convenient blood sugar friendly snack options that is pre-packaged and ready to take on the go. So I want to introduce everyone to Good Measure Bars. Good Measure Bars are a great blood sugar friendly snack that make it easy and delicious to say yes to snacking. I can personally vouch for the brand as a brand partner. So their popular peanut butter and dark chocolate nut butter bar combines nuts, seeds, as well as those dark chocolate morsels that renders a subtly sweet, deliciously creamy, and lightly crunchy snack bar. So seeing that we're talking a lot about nutrition, I will definitely do a disservice if I don't talk about the nutrition facts label for just a little bit because we are so keen on consuming nutrient-dense foods. So these bars contain five grams of net carbs, which have little impact on blood sugar, eight grams of protein, and three grams of sugar. Those are good numbers, and I'm thinking right now, as you're saying a little bit about what's a healthy snack, I got my producer upstairs, and you know she's probably gonna cut out my gummy bears from now on. But I just want you to know that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do better. We're gonna aim to do really better. Where do people get more information uh, to really be able to deal with this? Yeah. So for more information, they can easily go online at allingoodmeasure.com to check out the bars as well as more information on the nutrition. And Kim, I also got to ask you this question about looking at the back of the pack, looking at the back and really checking out ingredients. I think when we're younger, pay no attention to it. The first sign of getting older is you put your glasses on or you look real quickly <laughs> and you grab those numbers and you're taking a look at those numbers. How important is it for us to really go ahead and look at those numbers at the back of the pack? 
Yeah, so looking at the numbers makes you more of an informed consumer. So you know exactly what you are putting into your body. So as I always say, pay attention to the protein, pay attention to the fiber, and make sure that the fats that are in the product are coming from healthy fats. So I want you to look at the ingredients and make sure that you see some nuts and seeds when you look at the ingredients label on the package of any product. So I want to put you on the spot, but are there any ideal numbers that I should be looking for when I'm talking about looking on the back of the pack when I see these things? Uh, any numbers in particular? This is a great question, and it's a question that I get asked on an almost daily basis. And so I'm going to tell bad. you what I tell everyone. Everyone has a different nutrition need. And the reason why we all have different nutrition needs could be related to our genetics, could be related to our gender, our activity level, what pre-existing conditions we have, and also what medications that we are taking. So what I always like to generally tell people is look for higher amounts. So for instance, if you find a package that contains one gram of fiber, well, look for another package that contains a higher amount of fiber, a higher amount of protein. By doing so, you are ensuring that you are getting more nutrients into your body. And so for people who need more information, of course, we want to make sure we're going to position them that they, find, they get to the website uh, and find out more about it. But final tips before we go, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the final tips are, number one, prioritize nutrition. I realize nutrition is highly focused on in the beginning of the year, and sometime around the summer, it kind of gets skirted underneath the rug. So always remember nutrition and always remember to reach for more fruits, more vegetables, more nuts, more seeds in your diet, not only at meal times, but during snack times as well. Kim, you are so helpful. The bottom line, watch those snacks, watch the numbers. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. I enjoy talking to you. All righty. Well, listen, now, if you want more information, don't hesitate. Visit the website at allagoodmeasure.com. Encourage you, don't go anywhere. We got more open coming up right after this. <laughs> Hello, BronxNet. Happy, happy, happy 30 years. 30 year anniversary. Boy, that went by fast. And also, my 10 years here has, at BronxNet has been even, has won by even faster. I have a show called Just Give Me the Mic. My name is Deborah Coco. And I just love everything about BronxNet. What I've learned here, I've actually t taken my studio production class, my field production class, and doing a show here has opened up so many avenues for me and led me to acting and meeting some incredible people I've been hosting and just having an incredible ride. So I still love coming to the studio and having my face-to-face -face interviews just like it was day one when I came into the studio. BronxNet has opened up so many opportunities for people within our community. But nonetheless, happy 30th anniversary and keep on helping people to create their own dreams within the media industry.
and welcome back. Tis the season. Colds and flu can disrupt daily life, causing sick days and absenteeism from school and or work. And given the close-knit nature of families that are gathering and the potential for kids to bring germs at home, well, it might seem challenging to shield yourself from these illnesses. Fortunately, there are some effective measures that you can protect you and your family with. And here now, to tell us more, we've got pediatrician Dr. Mona Amin. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. You know, I tell you, this time of year is kind of rough, particularly for parents. Um, you know, you got your kids, you go home to school. I mean, they come home from school, they come home from school with something. And before you know it, what they come home from school with, the whole house has. And um, how prevalent yes. is this? Oh, I see this all the time and I experience it too. You know, I have two little ones. One of them is preschool, a preschooler, and he's always bringing home germs because that's just the nature of being a preschooler around other children. So you're right on that this is a reality that when life happens, germs happen. And it's inevitable that you and your family may get sick from time to time. But I do believe in a adopting a germ prevention strategy that's more holistic. So looking at various things that we can add to help reduce our risk of getting sick, understanding that yes, illness can still happen, but hopefully we can reduce it and reduce the risk of spread. And when we talk about reducing, that's the number that we wanna see. We wanna see those numbers reduced across uh, the country. But on an individual basis at home, what do I do, first of all, uh, to protect myself from the, the spread of germs? So one of the things that we can do, obviously, is following CDC guidance for vaccines, like getting the flu shot, as recommended. And as a reminder, it can reduce our risk of getting the flu, but more importantly, it can help reduce the risk of complications and hospitalizations, including in children. And then you mentioned around the home, and cleaning and disinfecting your home regularly can help keep keep germs at bay. And so I recommend tackling those germy, high-touch and high-traffic areas like counters, doorknobs, remotes and light switches with things like disinfecting solutions like Clorox disinfecting wipes, which kills 99.9% .9 of germs on hard non-porous surfaces and using this especially when someone is actively sick in the house so that hopefully other members of the house won't get sick too. Got a dear friend and she is a uh what we call oop, germaphobe. And so she wants to make sure that every time you turn around, there's a wipe down, there's a wipe down, there's a wipe down. But really, how often should a person be wiping down? I'm not trying to put her on the spot. I don't want her to call me or that again, but, I, I, <laughs> but we're going to make this plain for the average person. This is a great question. And the answer to that is that it could really depend on the person, the family, and who's living in that household. For example, if it's all adults who are healthy, they may only do disinfection when someone's sick. Or if there's a newborn or a baby in the house or someone who's immunocompromised, they may take a little more precaution on using um, wipes and you know disinfecting this um, more often. So it really is important to understand that this is a case-by-case -case basis and a family has the tools that they need, whether it's the Clorox disinfecting wipes or their disinfecting mist, um, to be able to help reduce that risk however they see fit. Talk to me a little bit about washing hands. We hear about this all the time. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Then I get, you should wash your hands, sing a song, wash your hands, do this. <laughs> you know, we got a whole lot of different yeah. remedies for washing hands. How effective or what, what are the proper ways to have the effective way of, uh, or I should say, effectively wash your hands? Well, you are right. The, mo the reason why it's so important is that most germs enter our body through our mouth, our nose, and our eyes. So, for example, you touch something like a door handle and then wipe your face, wipe your eyes, and then now germs have entered through your mucous membranes, which is part of your face. And so that is how we get germs into our system. So that is why washing our hands and underneath fingernails when you wash your hands is so important. And the most effective way to do this is to wash your hands for 20 seconds minimum, with warm soap and water, and like I said, get under those fingernails. And for anyone who is tuning in that has a child, like I do, that is resistant to hand washing, making it this, this a matter of fact thing and a boundary. Hey, it's time to wash our hands, not do you want to wash your hands. If you wanna, wa if you wanna eat, if you wanna play after this, you have to wash our hands before we do this. Let's go to the bathroom, I can help you, or you can walk there yourself. They can choose what soap they use, but the hand washing is an important boundary if you make it an important boundary in your home. And frankly, you have to model it as well. If you're not washing your hands, your child's not gonna follow suit. <laughs> yeah. 
how important are these high touch services? Because uh, we hear a lot about high traffic areas, high touch services. But how important is it really in maintaining this uh, to, to achieve this goal here? Yeah, so those high traffic surfaces, like I mentioned, and things that you may not even realize, cell phones, remote controls are very notorious, toilet flushes. These high traffic and high touch areas can have germs that live on it for a while, and the duration can depend on the germ. But it is important that when, again, someone is sick in the house especially, that we are san uh, disinfecting those surfaces so that, again, another person who may be healthy doesn't touch that surface and then get that illness spread to them as well. Yeah. We talk about this going on a lot in households. And uh, how is the workplace really being impacted by this, too? We talk about the house, but what about work? Yeah, so I'm a practicing clinician, I'm a pediatrician, and my husband's an ER doctor, by the way, and we see germs constantly. Um, it is the season, you know, whether you're in Florida where I'm located or New York or the West Coast, germs are everywhere. So it is our peak season for viruses. And, you know, a lot of children get sick, maybe they have a fever, they have to be monitored at home. And like you said, it can mean a lot of missing school, a lot of absenteeism, and a lot of families and parents having to call out of work. So I think this holistic reduction strategy is really important. So like I said, hopefully we can reduce the chances and also the frequency of illness, right? Illness can happen, but hopefully we can get from being sick every other week to maybe sick every few months um, by supporting uh, measures like I mentioned already. Yeah. I see some Clorox in the background. Uh, highly advised using some Clorox, huh? Yes, it's really important. Like I said, I, you know, we use it very much in our house with a younger daughter, an infant, and my son being a preschooler, especially when we had COVID go through the house recently and hand, foot, and mouth, and all these viruses that can go through the um, house. And the packaging says, you know, what viruses it can be effective for. But it's really important to, again, use this along with the other strategies to help reduce that spread as much as we can for our kiddos and also ourselves because it doesn't, it's not fun being sick. No, it's not, it's not fun being sick. And uh, certainly we know that the impact of one is being staying home and having not to be able to go out, it can be hard for families and definitely hard if you're a parent uh, and, uh, you know, you're trying to take care of not one kid but multiple children who are, uh, oh, yeah. who are actually sick. Uh, so what are some good places for me to go to get some information? Yeah, so for more helpful tips and tools on how, do we, how we can reduce the risk of germ spread in our home, please visit Clorox.com for more information. And we talked a little bit before we go, uh, we talked a little bit about how germs actually stay on surfaces. And there, it, it, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, um, so each, you know, when we talk about germs on surfaces, numbers in terms of time and how long they actually, before they, they dissipate, that, that varies, I guess. Yes, you are right. That varies on the type of surface, but also the virus and germ that we're talking about, which is why it's hard to give some blanket, you know, responses and answers. But it really has to do with, again, those high-touch surfaces, if someone is really is sick in the home, they're touching that surface over and over, right? Let's say a remote control. So that is something that you're going to want to consider because the germ is just going to continue to live there as long as that person is sick, you know? So, yes, the duration can depend, but that is why it's important to adopt all these strategies, hopefully, so that we can help, um, help stop that spread in that house. And how does weather play a part in all of this? Uh, you made no problem letting us know you're down there in sunny Florida. Well, we're up here struggling up here in the cold. So uh, talk about. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You're not. You're not sorry. You just had to rub it in. But I understand. So we're gonna get through the interview. <laughs> <laughs> but talk to me about weather and and how that actually plays a part in this too. That is a great question. And so if we can be outdoors more, and I know that's difficult in the Northeast or um, colder climates, obviously, being outdoor can really help because when you're outdoor, germs are less likely to spread because you're not in a poorly ventilated area, trapped with other people who may have germs. And also exercise outdoors and sunlight can really help our overall mental health and overall well-being that can help reduce stress. And also that has an impact on our immune system. So it's a holistic approach here, like I said. So resting, getting sleep, prioritizing sleep, managing stress, 
staying hydrated with water, obviously if it's an, a child old enough to drink water, these are some basic strategies to help support our immune system. And like you said, our peak virus time actually is in the summertime as well in Florida because many people are indoors because it's so hot and humid. And right now, although I do see a lot of illness, it's not nearly as much as what I see my Northeast colleagues seeing because of the weather. So weather does have an impact. Humidity has an impact, as in some viruses thrive more in humid vir environments. Some viruses thrive more in drier climates. So it really just depends on where you live and maybe what viruses you are currently seeing at the moment. Dr. Bonami, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for being with us. And I want to assure you, I am not a hater. I'm just not. <laughs> I love living in a warmer climate in winter, so I'm happy. <laughs> I'm living vicariously so through you. Me. Thank you so much for being with okay. us. All righty. Listen, if you want more information, please go ahead and visit the website at Clorox.com. Yeah, I love New York, but you know this winter thing and this snow thing, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, when winter starts wintering, it's a problem. All right, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after this. This year, BronxNet Community Television needs your support. For more than 30 years, we've been providing community programming shows, education courses, and access to our world-class television studios, a place where Bronx residents can call home. Community leaders and organizations can share their ideas, stories, and passions for what matters to us. We are still going strong, working hard each day, building new studios, creating new jobs and expanding our digital inclusion opportunities so that your voices can still be heard. Every dollar counts. Donate to BronxNet and keep the momentum going and continue building a better Bronx with BronxNet. And we are back over the last 10 years. The Bronx Documentary Center's education program has provided hundreds of middle school as well as high school students from the South Bronx the opportunity to have free documentary photography as well as multimedia classes. Now, armed with considerable talent and developing skills, BDC students are telling community stories accurately and creatively, building intimate portraits of the borough that so many people call home. And joining me now is Bronx Documentary Center's creative director, Mike Camber. Then we've got alumni, Alexa Pacheco, and then student, Brandon Carrillo Leon. And we thank you so much for being with us all, and uh, good to have you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, let me start off a little bit about this. Uh, and I'll, I, I think I got three people talking. To, well, can I hear? I'm trying to, I got a little feedback. I got it. I think we're clear now. But uh, let me start off, Mike, with you and talk a little bit about this because uh, when we talk about the Bronx Documentary Center, the opportunity to really uh, impact community and then also students. Yeah, we started our program 10 years ago with just, I think we had five or six kids. Uh, now we're up to almost 100 kids a year. Uh, we've had over 500 kids come through the program. And they're out on the streets uh, interviewing and photographing people. They're doing a student newspaper. Uh, we've got the book of their work that we just published. And, um, you know, we've got a college success program. So 100% of our students are going to college every year. Uh, so, you know, there's just so much talent here in the borough. And, uh, you know, we just we get them the resources and training they need. And, uh, Brandon, talk to me a little about what you do uh, for yourself, the opportunity to do a little with photography, journalism, uh, give me some of uh, what goes on. Um, basically, what goes on is we attend classes every Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday and Thursday, and we we go out and talk to the community and practice our skills with the camera, with um, interviewing people, and stuff like that, and just get closer with the community. 
and hear people's stories and document it. Yeah. So when you first approached this program and said I wanted to be a part of it, uh, what were your expectations, Brandon? Um, when I approached the program, I was like very like I I wanted to just test test it out and see how it was, and I just wanted to get photography as a hobby. And but after I joined, I like I couldn't leave. Like I I was like so I was I just loved the community, the Bronx Tech Community Center. Everybody there, everybody's so welcoming, nice. It's like a family. Yeah, Alexa is an alumna, and uh, as you talk about your experience. Uh, what did you actually gain uh, having the experience of going through the program and now being on the other side? Well, actually, I'm not an alumna yet. It's my last year at the Bronx Documentary Center, but I am applying to colleges. So I feel like everything that I've learned at the Bronx Documentary Center is helping me apply to colleges and add to my activities list. And my college essay is actually about the Bronx Documentary Center. Center and an experience that I had in my sophomore year. And to have the opportunity to have your work being recognized, I'll come back to Mike in just a second, but uh, either one of you can jump in there and talk about what does it mean for you to be able to have your work recognized and to be seen out there uh, for the public to say, hey, this is that. Um, I don't know if you want to take this one, Brandon, but... <laughs> Um, thank you, thank you. Um, to make it short, um, I don't know, I feel like it's such an honor to have my work um, recognized at such a young age, especially, for example, when, when I was 14, I was, um, I was featured in an um, article that we did for the New York Times, and to be published at such a young age, I feel like that's really made a big impact on me. And it made me want to pursue not only photography as a hobby, but as a career. Brandon? Um, it's made me like, um, I didn't know that we would be recognized. Like I was, I think 13 when I was recognized, I think it was at the Met. And from so on, I've been interviewed by other news stations like um, Univision and stuff. And being so young and getting this recognition is like, it's like a feeling of accomplishment and something I wouldn't want as just a hobby in maybe my, my life. Yeah. And Mike, the opportunity for these students to have their work disseminated, passed out so many can see it, um, obviously it's a bonus for the program, but talk to me about how you've been able to take the program and take it not just from uh, a local perspective of teaching, but really using it to educate the masses about the skills and the talents of these wonderful young people. Yeah, we really, we really work on getting the students' work out there. You know, we, we get it out around the neighborhood, um, but we've also shown their work internationally. They've had exhibitions in Paris, France. Um, a number of our students have uh, traveled to Japan for a big photo festival where they've been able to share, the, share their work. Uh, they've traveled to Norway. So um, we're working on a, uh, a relationship now with a, a group in Mexico uh, down in Oaxaca. So you know, we, we really spend a lot of time getting their work out there, getting it published. Again, they've been published in the New York Times. They've been published uh, in The Guardian in London. You know, so, so um, you know, they've got great points of view. Um, it's, it's amazing to see how intimate the work is when students are out photographing their own communities, their own families, their neighbors. And uh, the, wor the work is powerful, and people around the world have seen this work. So it, it makes a difference. And for students, Mike, that have the opportunity to really take their work to the next level, we know that some really were just checking the program out, and it's turned out to be more than they expected. And I think Brandon's talked about that. Alexis kind of led, led, uh, led a little into that. What do you yeah. think for you would be that secret sauce that really uh, impacts these students in the way that it does? Well, you know, I think, I think there's a... a, a legacy of, of photojournalism and documentary photography in this country that's just extraordinary that was key in the civil rights movement it was been key in a key part of the environmental movement uh, you know of, of so many different social justice movements and that's really what these students are learning they're learning that photography can make a difference it can inform um, you know just the basic tenets of journalism are so powerful 
Uh, and also we, we focus a lot on writing skills, you know, and that's something our students, research skills, computer skills. So these are all things that they need that service them in all kinds of ways in their lives. Yeah. Alexa, Brandon, I'll start with ladies first. Uh, how do you see using the skills that you have now and that you gained through this program in the future? Well, I'm actually going to pursue photography now in the future. I, um, for like the longest time, I didn't know. I knew that I wanted to do art, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And finding the Bronx Documentary Center has just led me down a path that I just know that I'll hold on to forever. And I'm just so grateful to the Bronx Documentary Center. I feel like I should add that in there. But I'm, I think in the future, I'll be able to utilize what I've learned and kind of create new things, I guess, to kind of sum it up. But I know for the fa for a fact that in the future, I'm going to use everything that I learned at the Bronx Documentary Center, hopefully. <laughs> Brandon. Um, yeah, the, I've learned so many new skills from the Bronx Documentary Center. It's like, um, I will learn how to work a camera, which I thought was like super difficult until until like the first day I attended. It's like super easy. It's just when you learn learn the words and they teach you hands on. It's it's amazing. And I've learned many computer skills with Photoshop and photo mechanic, which I, I also thought was very confusing before I learned those. And so if a young person's out there right now, Mike, and say, listen, this is something that I think about uh, and I want to get into, what do, I, what do they do? Oh, please, please contact us. Uh, we're at bronxdoc.org is the website, B-R-O-N-X-D-O-C dot uh, org, bronxdoc.org. And, um, or they can email us. It's uh, education at bronxdoc.org. And uh, we're getting ready for our, you know, we're already making preparations for our spring and summer programs. So, um, you know, we're, we're always looking for new students and uh, there's a lot of opportunities here. We're got students from all over the Bronx. A lot of our students walk, walk to the program every day, but we also have students from, you know, North Bronx, East Bronx, West Bronx. So, um, you know, we, we, we'd love to talk to you if you're interested, if you have a passion or just a curiosity about photography, we can get you started. And when is the next, uh, when's the next chance for students to participate? Uh, well, we've got, you know, we've got our, our student exhibition, so you can come and check that out if you're a, a teenager or any, any resident, any age of the Bronx. That exhibition will be up through March 3rd, so um, that's a great chance to meet teachers uh, and meet other students here. And um, we've got a bunch of workshops coming up, so there's, there's kind of like a rolling, uh, a, a rolling uh, list of events and educational opportunities. Yeah. Well, Mike, keep up the great work in impacting the lives of young people. I think they, you see the fruit that's fallen from the tree. It really looks very good. Uh, Alexa, Brandon, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All righty. It's a pleasure. Good. Thank you. Our pleasure here. Listen, now, if you want more information, we encourage you. Visit the website, bronxdoc.org. Bronxdoc.org. There you can find out and get your young person uh, enrolled. And if you're a young person, take your skills to the next level. Well, we have come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us and you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recablecast on Optimum's Channel 67, Verizon Files, that'll be Channel 2133, or watch us anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Of course, you got your brand new episode of Open with Rita Valentine on Friday. And uh, this about wraps up this episode. I am Darren Hyman saying take care. Make sure you keep this channel wide open and uh, God bless. We'll see you soon.